I, co I interviewed them, asked them why they wanted this, and he didn't really seem like he wanted to be here. That's true. I, when I came here, I wanted to be here. I applied before, I didn't really... Masters in what field? Biology. Biology? Yeah. All right. So, in, for the meantime, you're here. Never too late. You want another one? Okay. Pardon? By default. Uh, yes. Yeah, if by different. default. I'm here till Fisher at least. And if by default. Probably would. Second so, time, I hear what did you, uh, how did you follow through on your uh, resolution? Uh, well, I'm just keeping up with uh, things and everything. Yes. And, uh, That's the Nayus. Reviewing these oh. Mish uh, and trying to really review a while ago, not too long ago, but uh, some time ago, I suggested that everyone, before retiring at night, make a one-sentence summary of the day. What did I learn today? Something that stays out. I'll keep you on that track. Something that's kind of saying, okay, here's a message. There has to have been something that kind of hit you. So that's a good idea, I think, for everyone. I mean, I made it to everyone. I don't know who followed through. You did. You did too. No, this is actually a book of thoughts. I may not put there right now. Every like, thought that's not. Not like thought, like I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, what's next? Or it's like, I have a in my head that's specific. Mm -hmm. I write it down so I can see, like, look back. It's like, what was that thinking about? Is it legible? You're, is it writing legible? Is it... uh, it's getting more legible. I'm is you writing making, legible? I'm making a method now. Before it's write down, I mean, I'm trying to, like, you know, be able to keep that thought in my mind. So like, like Dr. Scribble, right? So when I first did, I had Scribble stuff, because the thought would, you know, come and vanish. But now I'm, like, you know, working, like, you know, be able to... Okay, I'd like, I'd like, to, uh, like, like so, to, uh, to look at it. Uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to do that. This is what Christian Shalamita is all about. Like a summary of the day. I look at it and say, am I stupid or something? Am I right? Am I there? Am I for real? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And if you're for real, then you have a very sweet sleep. You wake up in the morning all refreshed. What do you think? About what? You were here when, when we had this discussion. Which discussion? This discussion that we're currently concluding. Which is regarding? Wake up early. Oh, waking up early? No. <laughs> I got the last part of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> You're not one of those that, if, uh, unless addressed personally, you didn't hear anything. No, I heard something. I, I didn't hear everything. Right. Sorry. Well, what I said was, I suggested to everyone a long time ago, a long, relatively long time ago, that before retiring at night, we should jot down one sentence or a paragraph of ideas that we learned today, something that st stayed with me, something that has a meaning to me on a daily basis. I'm sure that every day we learn something, at least one thing, that has uh, lasting value. Okay, what do you think? I think it's a splendid idea. Splendid idea. Thank you. All right, so we'll start now. This is on already? Okay, look at this. A splendid idea is recorded. I'm missing some people. Where is Label? He's not here. He's not here? He's here. He's just not here right now. I think I can tell that. <laughs> I think he... Okay, whatever. Anybody else missing? Excuse me? What? Moshe. Moshe? Yeah, where's Moshe?
Moshe is a visible guy. <laughs> huh? Yeah. I don't know what. Do I need, need a separate invitation? All right, um, again, as I'm, we always do, we speak about the Pasha of the Week, based on Terebus Sichus, and ultimately uh, based on ourselves. Um, and since it's Tuesday, so this Rashi, which I'm going to address, you Presumably you all learned already. I'm assuming you're doing fitas to one that some extent. I'm not uh, at all uh, challenging you. I'm sure you do your best. Um, in today's Pasha, in general, Sefer Dvorim. Sefer Dvorim is, uh, is a very rich Sefer in terms of addressing directly the human element. Um, particularly in the beginning, as Khan and Akiv, one time I remember we were talking about Pasha's Akiv, which is next week. And when you think about Pasha's Akiv, it feels almost like a Fabrengen. Mr. Abedi is actually sitting and having a very intense fabrengen with a lot of mashkin, a lot of singing, a lot of introspection. And that's what Sefer Torim in general is. Pashas were as Hanon that you learned already, that those Pashas. Um, there's a Pasuk that is, we're all very familiar with. Hashem Hu Holikim and Eid Milvate. 
And Rashi, Rashi's comment on this posuk, which is, by the way, different than all other Mephoshim. Rashi says that this posuk pertains to the moment of Matan Torah. That when Eden stood at Matan Torah, they, Horaisa, they were they were allowed to see the absolute reality, absolute truth of Hashem's perfect unity. So Hashem hu halakim, that Hashem is halakim. Ein oid milvadoi, there is none besides Him. And at that moment, Eden were actually able, permitted to actually see through through. There were no obstructions to this absolute reality. Now they saw it not as a result of some proof, of some indicators, some nisim, niflois, some miracles. Miracles also prove Hashem's unity because it means that He, nothing, nobody, nothing can, can interfere with his, with his actions, nothing can obstruct His actions. Mitzrayim, all the miracles, but Matan Torah represented a very unique moment where we saw Hashem's, the, the truth of Hashem's unity in a manner, in a direct manner, without, any, without the need of any peripheral, any proofs. And, and uh, not only, the, uh, there was nothing, no camouflage at all straight out. As Rashi, the way Rashi expresses it, that Hashem opened all the heavens, all the skies, and they were able to see through, through, all the way to the, to the, to the eternity. And, um, and He broke open all barriers on the bottom. To be able to see in every direction um, 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 unlimited uh, vision and they saw the, the perfect unity of Hashem. What does this mean? They saw the perfect unity of Hashem. These are the words of Rashi. common thought process that we have in a positive way. I'm talking about a good thought process. is essentially based and focused on our own reality and own presence. I have to be a good person. I have to do the best that I can. And um, what is in, in the compelling element in this? Why should I do the best that I can? I mean, what is the compelling element? The, com the, the, the compelling element in this is my personal presence. I have to perfect myself. I have to be a, a, the best, you know, I have to build myself up. And I have to ultimately be able to face myself, to answer for my mistakes, to answer for my inadequacies. I definitely believe that, yes, I know that, that every person has to give a reckoning. Reckoning means you have to answer for your, for your actions. Ultimately, we all have to face, so to speak, a court hearing and where, where things have to be laid out very clearly, etc., etc., etc. So with all that thought process that kind of leads us in the direction of 
doing the right and, and progressing and building and so forth and growing. If you reflect on it, there's a certain difficulty coming along with it. And what is the difficulty? The difficulty is that we actually feel lonesome, lonely. It is all up to me. It's all on me. And I better be right and I better be good. And I'm kind of uh, alone in this, in this deal, in this affair. There's no, there no recourse, there's no support. Ultimately, I am alone with myself. And this loneliness is devastating. Generally speaking, loneliness is devastating to a human being. It's one of the greatest, greatest sufferings. In the, in the prisons, when they want to really hurt a prisoner, um, give him the message that he better behave or else, they put him in what's called confinement, in, in the solitary confinement. It's extremely, extremely suffering, big suffering. The Yamada tells the story of Choyne Hamage. Anybody heard of him? No. Choyne Hamage. Choyne was a big he is known as Hamagil, the one who made a circle around himself uh, to bring rain and so forth. He was a very great man, Choni. And there was an unusual story about this Choni. There were certain circumstances. He was asking, questioning the, the way of the world. And uh, as a result of that, he was, Hashem put him to sleep and he slept 80 years. And then he woke up. By the time he woke up, his grandchildren or great grandchildren were the, were the society. He didn't recognize anyone. Choyne went into the smedrash, into, into a shul, but the Tamil Hachon was sitting and learning. And they were debating about the statement that Choni made. Hmm. This one said, this is what Choni ma- meant. And this one said, this is what Choni meant. Then Choni himself comes in and listens to their debate. He says, I am Choni, and this is what I meant. They started laughing at him. What? You're Choni? Where are you coming from? Hmm. Choni is not here already. Muna is 80 years. And uh, Khani could not convince anyone, could not get into any kind of a, of a realistic conversation. And he pleaded with Hashem, he says, Ben Yisraelim, either give me Havrusi, either give me a, a, a Haver, company, or take me away from the world. I can't live alone. This is talking about Khani, this great scholar, this great tzaddik who could be sitting and learning for himself indefinitely, he says, I can't live like this. So loneliness is a very, very difficult, a very painful thing. And sometimes this sense of loneliness actually um, uh, uh, reaches us. When we begin to start thinking, I I have to answer, I have this duty. And um, if not, there's consequences. And, and I'm alone in this. What is it about? It's just about me. I don't know if any of one of you had ever realized this particular 
side of, 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 of our internal thinking. But in fact, this is there all the time. You don't question it. You don't realize what is bothering you. But there is that sense of loneliness. And when this sense of loneliness comes in, you know what happens as a result? Should me? Person gets suppressed. Huh? I give up. Huh. I can't. I don't mind it. I give up, and you go and do some things that you are going to be sorry for. Let me just jump out and go whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I can't imagine myself. Go to a bar. I go to some kind of Michigan place. Do things that that are completely contrary to the principles that I was trying to imbue into myself. So this posik, Ato Horeisu Lodas, Ki Hashem Hu Ho Elikim, Hashemayim Yimau Alorot Mitokas Einoit. For those who need translation, I will translate. You were shown, you were allowed to see, actually, Horeisu, you were allowed to see, so that you would actually be, have a personal knowledge that Hashem is Ho Elikim, Hashem is the, the Creator and the Presence but Shomai Mimal in heavens above and the earth below, ain't no, there is none other. What is the message in this? The message in this is not that there is no competing force and that the only one you have to answer to is to Hashem. And therefore you better behave. That is not the message. Please understand what this message is saying. There is much very deep Hasidic thought in explaining these words, Einoid Milvadai. Some of it you already learned, some of it you will learn, some of it maybe you'll never get to learn. The point of this is this goes beyond, this is speaking about Hashem's unity, Hashem's true unity, beyond His presence in the world. That in the world there is no, none other. And that He is sole authority in the world. And He does whatever He wants in the world and none can interfere with this. This goes beyond that. This speaks about Hashem. Hashem, the reality of Hashem as Hashem is completely above above world as He is unto Himself. The reality, the God, the reality itself. We are defined here in the world. And we have to live in the world. We have to function in the world. What's the point of knowing Hashem as He is beyond the world? Outside, uh, totally remote, totally uh, in, uh, above the whole, the whole, the whole phenomenon of creation. What's the point? And yet, this is what the Baruch uh, Rabbein is telling you. And this is what occurred at Matan Torah. The Baruch is giving us a Torah. He's telling us how we should behave where, above the world or in the world. Do not steal, do not rob, do not kill, do not uh, be good. I mean, all of these things. This is right in the world. What's the point of showing us how Hashem, the unity of Hashem, the true unity of Hashem, beyond world? The point is extremely, extremely significant. Not only significant, powerful, and extremely useful, effective. Because what this is saying is that we are never, never, never alone.
Yes, you have to do things. You have to do things. You're privileged to do things. You have the, the, the blessing of doing things. But, you're, but Hashem is always there. Not only is there supervising you, watching how you act. That's a, complex, that's a separate issue. You're always, you're always acting, you're always living, you're always um, present in the reality of Hashem's presence. You're never in a vacuum. You're never in no man's land. And now you have to pay for yourself and take care of yourself. Never. Because no matter where in the world you would be, and the world is uh, by nature obstructing, you know, you, you cannot see beyond this wall. Beyond this wall is another world. And beyond that mountain is another world. You know, it's, and you right here, insulated, isolated in this, and I said in the, you know, solitary confinement. That's all applicable, that's all true within the, the um, worldly structure, within the worldly um, functioning levels. The absolute reality of the godly presence defies all of these obstructions. Totally. And it is this truth of the godly unit, the godly, the, the godly presence that that it creates everything that declares everything, oh, I want this, I want this. This is real, this is, this is what I want. And when you act the way you're acting, a good act, Hashem is, is applauding it. He says, oh, that's exactly what I want. It's wonderful. It's reflecting my presence. It's allowing me to be with you. And when you're acting differently, Hashem is encouraging you, Get off this. Come back here. Do, do, do the right thing. I want to be with you. That is the reality that Hashem had shown us at the time of Matan Torah to facilitate the receiving of the Torah. To make it possible for us to receive the Torah and follow through on its, all its commands no matter what they are, the most simplest or the most complex. And, and to give us, so to speak, the, the, the full encouragement, the full resource with which we can perform these commandments in a manner that we do not feel isolated, we do not feel alone. We do not feel just the yoke of the burden that who knows what stick is hanging over my head that if I make a mistake. That is not the way it's meant to be. To give you a very mundane and simple illustration, we're talking about baseball. What is, what is the, uh, the point of, of the um, fans sitting, thousands of fans sitting in, in, in a stadium, watching the, the hitter hit the ball? Okay. Ugh. And he had a good ball, ah, and a big uproar. Ah, what? What's the point? Is that... The hitting the ball, you're alone over there. You're standing over there, and you and you're now watching this 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 pitch, and the pitcher is watching you, and you, and, and uh, you know uh, you're sitting there and traveling. You know, what if the pitch just 
ducks and whatever it is, and you're going to miss it, and you're going to you're going to get off the court, right? And so you have to do, you have to be fully concentrated. So what, what's the point of the, these tens of thousands of friends around you? If you're alone, you can't do it. If you have, if you have, uh, if you're part of reality, uh, then, then it's a completely different thing. Then you have, then you have all your resources with you. Why? This is, as I said, a very simple, mundane illustration. When kids go to play, when kids go, when kids go, um, when children, little children, we make a big thing, they graduate from pre-1A into first grade. It's a whole graduation thing. And who comes? The hall is full. The brothers and the sisters and the uncles and the aunts, uh, let alone the parents, the grandparents, whoever is around, they sit around, and this little pipsy comes up, and he gets a diploma. He graduated pre-1A, or, 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 or he graduated uh, um, a nursery school. Okay? No longer diapers. No more diapers. Yay! I'm sorry? It's funny, right? It's real. It's real. It's very real. And it's not just a question of a pat on the back. It's not a pat on the back. It's a sense of being part of reality. Not something that you are superimposing upon yourself out of fear, out of love, whatever it is. It's not something that you're creating. It's there as a reality. This reality is, in, is extremely important. So, when you are in, in nursery, it is the parents watching you, or, or and, uh, when you're in first grade, it is this. When, when you graduate at high school, and you graduate it and you go further and you come to and you're an adult, then that reality is still absolutely necessary. And, the, and your parents cheering you up is not going to do it anymore. It's not going to do it anymore. Now you need a completely different cheerleader. You need the real reality. You have to know that you are part of the, of, the, of, of the real existence and that your existence is for real and that every act of yours is significant. Why is it significant? Because you live in a significant environment. Because there's significance to life. There's reality to life. And it's not just, oh, I'm going to graduate, I'm going to make a lot of money, or I'm going to get a pat on the back. None of that. This is all fine and good, but ultimately this is being lonely, lonesome. And it doesn't carry, doesn't carry the ball. This is why, by Matan Torah, Nashem gave us a Torah. He let each one of us see, and as you know, Okay, this is something which you have to project, you have to understand, you have to believe. The fact is that every Jewish soul was present at Matan Torah. And we all saw, and we all related to this absolute reality, to Hashem's real presence. And from then on, Ayid is never alone. If one feels alone, senses that he's alone, that is due to the, the misinformation that the Yitzhak and 
creates for him, or the world creates for him, whatever the, the, the lack of, of, of recognizing the truth. It's possible to, it's possible to see things that don't exist, which are not, not to see things that do exist. You know, you mentioned it, I'm sure everybody knows about this famous Rambam, where there's, there's certain halachas, certain mitzvahs that are incumbent upon a person to do, like in uh, making a quorum with certain bonus and so forth, and uh, it cannot be done under duress. In other words, he cannot be forced to do it. A quorum has to be it has to be lived, so he has to be volitional, has to be by his consent, and if he does not consent, doing it for him is not going to it's not going to have, have no validity. In certain circumstances where he is truly obligated to bring this karma to do certain things and he refuses, so the halacha is that koifin oisei achirim reitzani. Everybody knows what this is? Nobody knows what this is. Some know what it is. Means that we force him until he says, I want. So there are many, many, many different cases. There might be divorce cases. We're splitting up the first one because they have to do it um, not under duress but by their own volition, and it's the second category. No, 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 no. You make it their volition. Um, they have to do it volitionally. In other words, they have to say, I want. And even he says, I don't want. We beat him until he says, I want. That's essentially what it is. Okay. So this is kind of counterintuitive. What, what's going on over here? Are we fooling ourselves? What is this? So our great teacher, the Rambam, explains that when a Yid says that he does not want to do what Hashem wants him to do, what the Torah says wants to do, the, the various ways that the Ramam expresses it, he is lying. He is lying. He is lying. means he is lying. He thinks he's telling the truth. <clears throat> but he is then not in his in his free self. He is then confused by his own Yetzirah. The Yitzhah kind of superimposes itself upon, upon him and does not let him do what he really wants to do. Therefore, when we, when we, when we force him, when we beat him, and he says, I want, that I want is real, because he wanted it all along. Except what we needed is that he should say I want. So he said I want. But really, he really wants to do what Hashem wants him to do. Now, what is the rationale behind that? The rationale behind that is, of course, because he also has an official keys. He has a godly soul, and he really wants to, to, be, to do the right thing and so forth. But ultimately, ultimately, when he says, I don't want, it's like he is closing his eyes to the reality that he himself sees. Why is he closing his eyes? For well, whatever, whatever uh, Mr. Guy that, that fell into his mind. We know people that, uh, that out of stubbornness they can do things that can do harm to themselves. They can do things that, that they don't want to do. Got too big. And this is an example of that. It's totally irrational. 
and unnatural and unreal for a person not to 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 be oblivious to reality. And if he is oblivious to reality, it's because it's both a, a kind of a, 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 a window shade is being pulled down his eyes and, and, and he doesn't see. It is really important that we reflect on this truth. This is, as I said, this was shown at Matan Torah. And the reason it was shown at Matan Torah, even though Matan Torah means live in the world and do things in the world. But it is impossible to go through and do the things in the world in the right way when you don't have a reality to relate to, a reality to... to, to um, uh, to, incar- to, to incorporate in your actions. You're just in your little chamber, and there's nobody else there, just you. Impossible. So, Hashem at Martin Torah showed each one of us the godly reality that is way beyond any obstruction. It says that, that when Hashem created the world, you know, in the first day of creation, it was dark. Then Hashem said, let there be light. Let there be light. By here, there was light. And Hashem saw that the light was good. And he separated between the light and the darkness. And he called the light day and the darkness he called light. These few psukim are totally perplexing. Right? There was no sun. The sun was created on the fourth day. This is the first day. So there was no sun. What kind of light was this? There's no sun. And then, and then the light is good. Hashem saw the light is good. And he separated the light. Light and darkness need to be separated. Light and darkness? How do you mix light and darkness? And then the Gemara says a phenomenal thing. The Gemara says, that oil should never be imrishin, the light that was created on the first day, Odom Orishin, Mabit Bey, Mirim, Seifo Yerom Atsuifo. Odom was able to see with this light from one end of the world to the other. Okay. That's what the Gemara says. Now, let us assume that Odom Orishin had phenomenal eyes. Eagle eyes would be a, would be a joke. He had phenomenal eyes. He could see at the longest distance. But how can you see from one end of the world to the other? If there's a tree in the middle, you cannot see beyond that tree. Right? It blocks your vision. Vision goes straight. Vision doesn't go like that. The world is curved. He's standing on this side of the world and he sees the other side of the world. I don't see how that's possible. Forget about the limits of a person's vision. It's impossible. And then there is, like you said, right, there's the, the curve of the, 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 the earth curve. Right? And the curve, even, even if there's no obstruction, you, you stand in front of the ocean. How far can you see? A couple of miles? And then, and then it curves over and you can't see anything. This light had no obstruction. 
nothing obstructed this light. This light had no sun as a source. The, the, the light that the obstructable is because the, it, it has one source, and it comes from the sun, and when it hits this side of the cup, then the other side of the cup is not visible. Because it can be obstructed. This light has no obstruction because this light was present everywhere at the same time. It didn't have one source. It was a godly, a godly light allowing us to see the truth of the world. Another magician was, he was privileged to see the truth of the world. He was privileged to see how the whole world is really one great reality that, that represents the godly presence. You can see everything at once? Yeah. Yeah, we say we're not safe. We say we're not safe. I mean, if you have to walk to the other way and end the world, then, then that's not seeing we're not safe. Wait, it reflects godly. Presence. What? It reflects godly presence or it shows godly it, presence? It, it, it shows the godly presence. It is the godly presence. The world exists under godly presence, like the altar of expansion, Tanya, and so forth. And nothing can obstruct that. Nothing can obstruct that. Again, I'm repeating and then we're going to bring it down to us here. We must remember, do, we must not allow Chas Vashorim a sense of loneliness. A sense of this is, I must do it. No. Hashem is standing there right by your hand, by your side. And he's encouraging you, and he's, and, and he's giving you not only the encouragement, he's giving you the wherewithal. He's saying, that is, you, you're right here in, in the ultimate reality of, of existence. There's nothing greater that you can possibly do. Beyond, beyond the limits of the world. This is the, the reality in which we perform, in which we live. We spoke the other day, the other last week, I think, about the various things that you know that we are struggling with, the question of substance abuse and things of that nature. All of that is rooted in loneliness. Any time that a person falls down. Let's illustrate this. Let's follow this, okay? A person stands. He stands on his feet. Standing on your feet is not an automatic thing. You have to hold yourself up. Your, your mind your, your, has to be active, encouraged, has to be inspired to stand. It's much easier to lie down. It's an interesting thing that the human being stands on two. We discuss this many times. This is a unique creature. The dry land animals, they stand on four. The fish never stand. They're always lying flat. Because they are at the lower level of creation. They don't have that, that individual, individual stance. They're lying down flat. <coughs> They're always in bed. Even when they're moving on, they're moving on in bed. Dry land animals, at least they have to support themselves, you know, on, on four legs. The human being is a completely different, different thing. When the human being is a little bit, lack, has a lack of inspiration, what does he want to do? The first thing, lie down. He'd rather crawl on the ground. Falling on the ground, or lying down, there's a physical aspect that is reflected, but uh, the spiritual aspect of it is, is very, very significant. We do not fall down. We must, at all time, stand up. 
and relate to the reality. And as I said, the sense of loneliness, the sense that this is on me, and there is nothing else, and, and, and the whole world over there is just, couldn't care less how I feel. Couldn't care less how I feel. It's on me. That's a very devastating feel, feeling. It's false. It's just not true. The entire reality, the entire godly reality, cares how you feel. Not only cares how you feel, it cares what's going to be the next step. And gives you all the encouragement and all the strength to stand up and be a man. We mentioned it also in Hayom Yom, it says that one of the great blessings that Hashem gave, made for human beings, is that the human being, at all times, sees the earth and the sky, right? As you walk, the normal way to walk is you see the sky. What is the, what is the significance of seeing the sky? Think about it. You know what claustrophobia is? Everybody heard of claustrophobia? Claustrophobia is a sense that a person feels that he is claustered, he is, he is, he is, he is contained in, in a box. A person, human being cannot contain a box. Human being has to relate to infinity. This is what's holding him up. Seeing the sky along with the earth, seeing the infinity of, the, of, the, of existence, that's a human being. Even on the physical level. This is the blessing that on the physical level you might even see, oh no, wait, there isn't this reality here. This physical reality, this physical reality is reflective of Hashem's reality. Of the reality of, of, of the Creator. This is why it's such a grand, grand world. Reflecting on this is imperative. Living with this is imperative. This knowledge that Hashem, Hashem's presence, Hashem's presence and, and, um, beyond creation, the real, the, the ultimate absolutely Hashem's presence is there with us in our world all the time. This is what keeps us up. And up off the ground and keeps us up and doesn't allow us to fall. We're falling down to, as I, sorry, I said, to, to to reduce our consciousness, to play on with our consciousness, play on with our emotions, to make us less sensitive and less uh, alert, is the most ridiculous thing. Most ridiculous thing. It's falling down to the ground instead of being held up by the sky. A human being is supposed to be held up in the sky. What's the expression? The sky is the limit. That's the human thought. This is what Rashi, the Rebbe emphasizes that Rashi, I mean, of course we elaborate a little bit different, but that's, Rashi speaks Pshuta Shulmika, it's called. Pshuta Shulmika means the simple Pshat of the possible. He speaks to every Jew. He speaks to a child, a five-year-old kid, like the Rebbe says, Berchomish Mikro, and he speaks to the adult who is many times that age. Because everyone needs this. The child needs the cheers of his parents, the adult needs the cheers of the neighbors. The presence, the company. The reality. Uh, 
I really hope that here in, in Seagate, in the yeshiva, we will, we will gain this sense of reality in our lives for all time. So that we will never, ever have the urge to fall down to the ground and give up God's will. There's no such thing. This is what learning Torah is about, what learning Chesidus is about, and this is what what Torah and Mitzvah is all about. So this is our hope. This is our prayer. This is my wish to all of us. I would like very much to see a write-up of this talk from each one of you. Do me the favor. A brief write-up. What did I take from this talk? from this rush. Okay. Have a good evening. Good afternoon. Remember, um, I think it was in, in this class, the council we were talking, that Hashem, even on a physical level, that people think that they stand on their own accord, or they sit up straight on their own accord, but if it wasn't for Hashem holding us up at the whole time, it's, just, it's the same idea. Yeah. If they actually physically stand. Yeah, it's a spirit that holds us up, but not... Physically, you can't stand up like this. Right. It's totally irrational. It's, it's, <coughs> it can't be explained physically. How do a person stand? You know, <coughs> you're a six foot foot, a seven foot. Right? You're standing on what? Let's say your foot is a foot and a half. Right? And it's very solid. How is that? Try to put up a pole like that. Right? You're not standing on the ground, you're being held up by the sky. And in order to be held up by the sky, the sky has to be a real. It has to be a sense of reality. Yes. This is what we're experiencing all the time. We don't realize how profound that experience of seeing the sky, of seeing the, the tree standing up, how profound that experience is, how much we understand of it, way beyond the, of what we realize, what we understand. This is the human spirit. This is the human spirit. Friends, baseball fan, I just missed the point. Is <coughs> it people chair? Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. What, what's the point about this? The point is that that a person cannot act, cannot act yeah. in isolation in, in when he's alone. It's Kafka endorsement. I'm sorry? It's endorsement for him, yes, but he can do it by himself. He can't. It's not that you're going to watch, you're not going to hit the ball. He's going to hit the ball, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. At best, he will project and say, if I practice and practice and practice, when I get onto the field, so I'll have, I'll have people cheer me. But if there's no human beings, there's nothing there. Everybody knows that the that the fans the fans have a tremendous influence on yeah, the game. It's stupid. Anyway. It's stupid. It's really stupid. The whole thing is stupid. stupid. Is stupid. I is agree with that. Wait a second. Wait a second. I'm not encouraging sports. you to go to the baseball field, and I'm not encouraging anyone no, no, to go to the field. And and, and 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 I'm just giving us no, no, an I'm example, an illustration of of human nature. It is a human nature. A human being cannot be alone, cannot be lonely. And what I'm saying is we're never lonely. 
That's my say. When it comes to, to living as a human being, to tell you the is never lonely. Even Adam felt lonely. Adam, uh-huh. Adam, Harishon, felt lonely. That's why he got Chava. Also, in a way. Well, uh, no, that's, that was a different, uh, different uh, aspect. No. no. What? Would you say, like, the, like, the whole concept of, like, uh, like sports, things like that, is... At what? In the analog, I mean, the, the concept is that the, the sports is a, is a motion for... for for how are we supposed to the, the, right? the whole concept of sports sports is, is supposed to be like a, a muscle for how we're supposed to live our lives and we're supposed to be connected with other people and, and well be living on our own, no? you know true and, and the false everything has to, has its limit and how it's over done you know, I, I explained a car a car has a very important function a human function Right? It can transport a person from one end of the world to the other. Because a human being really is not limited to where he is. A human being perceives himself in a, in a you know, the whole world is my, is my domain. So he has to be able to get out. So people invented cars and they built wonderful cars. The best of these cars, what do you do with them? They put them into a, into a racing track and they go in circles. And they race and they race and they race and they race and they race. And where did they get to? The same point where they started. That's stupid. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, I mean, the, uh, the whole thing of like, they, like uh, whatever sports, it's nothing if well, it's, it's, it's not for other people. Well, well it's, yes. And it's encouraging to young people. It's encouraging in the sense that people can uh, show what, what excellence a person can reach, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, but, but it's nothing if you're not... Uh, the thing in itself is nothing. The thing in itself is nothing. But it is encouraging to people to know that there is a certain, that excellence is a good thing to pursue. But there is excellence in that, but in learning, certainly excellence in learning is definitely a good thing to pursue. Okay.